Welcome to Canada's Great Unknown, where, in this feature, we take a look at some spooky stories from listeners just like you. Haunted hockey rinks, haunted houses, and haunted bars. Yes, believe it or not, the west coast of Canada has some great ghostly tales that we're about to share with you. So sit back, relax, and enjoy these allegedly true stories of ghosts from areas you may know. If you have a story that you would like to share with us, email us at Canada's Great Unknown at gmail.com. We'd also really appreciate you following us on Twitter at CGU Stories and on Instagram and TikTok at Canada's Great Unknown. Also, if you could, hit that subscribe button and ring that bell right here on our YouTube channel so you can follow along every time we post new content to Canada's Great Unknown. Don't forget to leave a comment below and let us know what you think or stories you would like to hear about. When I was in my early 20s, before heading off to college, I worked at a hockey rink. It was a small training facility mainly used by instructors to train players in their skills. I never really played hockey, as growing up my parents could barely afford food on the table, let alone me and my sisters playing sports as an extracurricular activity. Plus, I was never really the most coordinated guy and the thought of putting on skates terrified me because I was afraid to embarrass myself in front of all the jocks and jockettes who looked like they were the second coming of Eric Lindros or Joe Sackick at the time. This was in the early 90s, where it was still pretty easy to get a job. My duties at the hockey rink were cleaning the ice, driving the Zamboni, janitorial-type duties around the rink. Cleanup. Lots of cleanup. But I didn't mind. I was making good money to save up for my tuition, and it sure beat hot tarring roofs for a living like a couple of my buddies were doing. As much as I loved my job and the hours I worked, there was always something creepy about that rink. I don't know what it was, but something about it always gave me the willies. I remember talking to my boss Gord one night, who lived out of town and would sometimes sleep at the rink if he had an early morning training session on the ice. He asked me, Hey John, at night when you're here, do you sometimes have anything weird going on? Confused by this question, I asked, Weird how? He responded, I don't know. Just sometimes when I sleep here, I swear I'm hearing people walking around at night. Like ghosts? I asked. You mean you think this place is haunted? I, I don't know, man. But I could tell you, more than a few times I've been here, I've been weirded out at night, and it's kept me awake. We quickly changed the subject as I brushed it off. I wasn't into all that paranormal crap and really didn't believe in it. But I guess I stored the thought deep in the back of my mind because as time went on, I really noticed some weird things happening at the rink that to this day, I can't explain. It started off one night when I was driving the Zamboni, cleaning the ice after everyone in the building was gone for the night. I had checked the dressing rooms and locked the entrance doors so I could get the rig clean before heading out to meet my buddies for a drink at the bar. I did the first lap around the ice, and as I came around for the second time, out of the corner of my eye, it looked like there was a man standing on the second floor in the viewing area, looking down at me. It quickly freaked me out. I turned my head for a better look, but there was no one there. The image that I swear I saw was a thick, dark, shadowy man standing near the glass, just staring at me. I tried to remain calm, but I was too shaken. I quickly cleaned the rest of the ice, parked the Zamboni, washed the ice from the machine, then ran back into the office, which was below the viewing area. I grabbed my keys, turned off the lights, set the alarm, and got the hell out of there. A couple of days later, when I saw Gord again, I told him what I saw. 
His ears perked up as he had said he had sworn he had seen the same dude up there as well about a month earlier. The next time something strange happened was my cousin and his girlfriend arrived at the arena to pick me up before we were all heading out. I told them I just had to clean and sweep the dressing rooms before we could go. They were nice enough to give me a hand. When we were in the final dressing room, there were these noises coming from inside the rink. Do you hear that? I asked my cousin. Yeah, he said. Who's on the ice? We were the only three in the building, and I locked the door behind you. The sound of hockey pucks hitting the boards and plexiglass makes a very distinct sound. Us three then ran to the entrance of the ice to see who was skating around, shooting pucks. But there was no one there, and not a single puck on the ice. Needless to say, we got the hell out of there fast. After many more noises on many more occasions, I started growing weary of working the night shift. Constantly feeling like I was being watched started to scare me. I hated being alone in that place. I don't know what was in there, but it was enough to get my imagination terrified. On the final occasion where I decided I had had enough, myself and another employee we'll call Paul were waiting for the final group of players to exit the building before we were going to go do a full cleanup and pressure wash of the dressing rooms. It was already 11.30 at night, and we had a dirty job ahead of us that would literally take us all night. We were waiting in the office, waiting for the players to exit the rink so we could get our long night ahead going. We could hear voices in the change rooms, laughing, swearing, and the sounds of their after-game beer cans clanging together when they threw the empties into the trash can. We saw the odd player go past us and exit the building while we were playing a game of cribbage while we waited. After about half an hour, I said, Paul, we got to get some work done here. We're going to be here until daylight if they don't leave. Head into the dressing room and tell those guys to hurry up and get changed. So Paul headed out of the office, down the hall, and through the door to where the dressing rooms were located. Less than a minute later, he raced back into the office. His skin was a pale white. I asked him, what's the matter? He responded, John, there's no one in the dressing rooms. What do you mean? We just heard them, I replied. I'm not going back there alone, Paul stated but there isn't a single person in any of the dressing rooms, and I'm not going back there again. So, I said, yes, you are, and you're coming with me. Paul and I walked back to see that, indeed, the dressing rooms were empty. All four rooms were vacant. We looked at each other and both agreed we were not washing the dressing rooms that night. We got our coats, left for a beer. I quit the job a couple weeks later to go to college, I never returned to that rink again. I didn't want to. I was too scared to be in that haunted hockey rink. If anyone's experienced something like this, I would love to know. Please comment below on this so I can read your reaction. Hi, my name is Gary, and back in 2001, I took a job transfer from Vancouver Island to Mission, British Columbia. It was a great opportunity for me and my growing family as it was going to bring us back home to the Lower Mainland to be near family and friends, along with being in familiar areas to where me and my now ex-wife grew up. This story is over 20 years old, but it is still giving me the chills when I think about it. It was the first haunted house I had ever lived in hopefully the last. My ex and I had two daughters at the time who were ages seven and two. Now, when we moved to Mission, we decided to move into a rental duplex as our best friends resided in the opposite side of us. We figured this was a home matched in heaven where they could watch our kids and we could watch theirs, trading off babysitting, which is expensive, sharing dinners, and play areas for their children and ours. The duplex wasn't big in square footage, but it was two stories and had three bedrooms upstairs. We knew it wasn't our forever home, but it was good enough for a couple of years for us to save up some money to buy our own place. 
Plus, as I stated, the location was perfect. However, a couple weeks after we moved in, we started noticing some little things that just didn't seem to add up. For instance, when my wife and I would go to bed, often we would hear the sound of scratching on the walls coming from inside our closet. At first we thought it was mice or some other kind of rodents, but that really didn't add up since our two cats always slept in our room but never pursued the odd noise. It wasn't often, like maybe once a week, but it did make things uncomfortable. We would hear knocking on the walls. I'd call over to my buddy next door and ask if he needed anything. Sometimes he'd state that they weren't even home, yet the knocking between the thin duplex walls continued. We'd check for break-ins and burglars, but there never seemed to be anything out of the ordinary. Each night with our children, we would have cleanup time before bed, where we'd help clean up their bedrooms before tucking them in for the night. However, by morning, their rooms would be just as messy as they were the night before, with toys, books, and dirty and clean clothes scattered all over the floor. We'd get mad at our children for messing things up so early, even though both girls would tell us they didn't make any of the mess. Of course, we never believed them, at least up to this point. Sometimes this would cause arguments between my ex and I, as I was someone who always liked having a tidy house, whereas she was more laid back and comfortable. It was about a year living in this place where we started realizing that our home could be haunted. What caused me to notice it was the lack of drinking glasses and teaspoons that seemed to have just vanished. At this point, there was no paranormal television to look at or thousands of websites to investigate for information. We just knew they were gone. At one point, we were down to three drinking glasses and two teaspoons. We searched all over the house for these, but they were just gone. Of course, before we thought anything paranormal, we looked for logical answers. We stripped down the house looking for glasses and spoons and found a total of one teaspoon under our daughter's bed. After doing some amateur sleuthing at the local library on ghosts, I read that sometimes these objects, for whatever reason, go missing in haunted houses. This seemed like coincidence to me. The more we looked into the idea that our side of the duplex was haunted, the more activity started to happen. The interesting part of it all was our best friend's side of the duplex had nothing for weird occurrences. This didn't make sense to us. But our side? It was becoming rampant. I remember one time while my wife and I were both out at work, I received a phone call from my buddy's wife next door asking if my ex and I could keep it down while she was trying to put their baby down for a nap. I said, we're both working. I'm out in Vancouver right now. No one is home. Sure you're not, she said. I hear both of you clear as day having sex on your bed. I asked her to go check and see if someone had broken into our home, to which everything was locked solid. But where I really got scared in our home was when I saw something I don't think I should have seen. I was watching sports highlights late one night when my youngest sleepwalked down the stairs I brought her over to me, laid her on my chest, and she fell back asleep. I ended up falling asleep as well on the couch, until the neighbor's dog started barking. That dog woke me up more times in the middle of the night than I could care to mention, and it usually pissed me off because sleep for me, with my job, was at a premium. I woke up facing the back of the couch, with my daughter laying on my arm as a pillow between me and the back. The dog was still barking, and my goal was to slowly roll over so I could get my arm out from underneath my daughter, then get up, open the window to tell the dog to shut up. As I started to roll over, I slowly turned my body and my head to face towards the television of my VCR. I could see the time. It was 4.02 a.m., but there was something foggy between my eyes and the VCR. As my eyes started to focus, I saw something that would forever change me. 
There was a little girl, the size of my daughter, standing about a foot and a half in front of me. I was seeing the clock right through her. Her big black eyes just stared mystically at me. I immediately froze and felt like I couldn't breathe. The little girl had long ringlet hair, pudgy cheeks like any two to three year old toddler would have. She was wearing a white nightie. The gaze on her face never changed. I wanted to scream so bad. I was so scared, but I didn't want to wake up my daughter or the rest of the house. I quickly did the only thing I could. I grabbed the blanket that covered my daughter and I. I threw it over my head, thinking this would be protection of some sort. I then pinched myself to make sure that I was indeed awake. In a panic, I tried to control my breathing because I needed to get my daughter and I upstairs to where the rest of the family was sleeping. It seemed safe up there. I took a deep breath. I rolled over again and she was gone. I have no idea where she went. I quickly gathered up my daughter in my arms and ran both of us upstairs into my master bedroom and hunkered down for the night. Two weeks later, I was out late on a guy's night out. My ex woke up to the sound of our piano playing. It was a constant knocking of the keys with irregularity that drove her nuts and out of her sleep, causing her to get out of bed, thinking that it was our two cats playing around and jumping on the keys. But to her surprise, she saw the same little girl in a white nightie pressing down on the keys. The little girl then stopped, turned, and looked up at my wife with a blank, dark-eyed stare that quickly made her run back into our bedroom. Becoming too much, we called in a psychic to check out our house. We'll call him Robert. During our reading, Robert explained that it was a very haunted property and we needed to think of moving. He said there were five spirits around that were causing havoc. Without giving Robert details of anything that was going on, he first mentioned if we had heard any noises in our closet, stating that a couple of decades previous, he was getting that someone overdosed in our closet. They went in there to shoot up and get high, but one day passed out and didn't wake up. The second spirit he picked up on was of the little girl, whom he stated was being chased down a very steep staircase that we had by her brothers, and she tripped fell, broke her neck, and died. The third spirit was the girl's mother, who allegedly was so distraught over the young girl passing away that she committed suicide in the bathtub after the daughter's death. There were two other spirits on the property, one in the backyard and one in the front, but they didn't cause as much harm as the others. Robert recommended that moving was a good option, otherwise the activity would continue to increase, causing strife and stress to our family. On the day we moved out, we were cleaning up some shelves by the bathroom, wiping everything down. That's where our last encounter occurred. As we were cleaning the shelves, from the storage room to our left, we heard the voice of the little girl say, Mommy! My wife and I immediately stopped what we were doing. Simultaneously, we both looked at the storage room, then looked at each other. Screw this, she said. We're out of here. We're never coming back. And we both ran down the stairs, locked the door, never to enter that place again. I've never had any other paranormal activity around me since then, nor do I want to. That place was a lifetime of experiences in the two and a half years we were there. I never, ever want to see that place again or experience the sight of that little girl. Hi, Canada's Great Unknown. My name is Cassie and I'm a 23-year-old student at UBC working towards my Bachelor's of Science. Coming from my family, believing in the paranormal is paranormal. Hope you don't mind my little play on words there to add a little humor. But let me explain. My father is an engineer and my mother is a doctor 
So growing up in a house full of science geeks, it's not too surprising to figure out how I grew up. The reason why I bring this up is because I had a paranormal experience last year that has really altered my way of thinking. I mean, science is supposed to have the answers to almost everything. And if it doesn't, then it's a really good guide towards what we will find in the future. However, when it comes to ghosts, well, as you can imagine, this has thrown me for a bit of a loop. Let me explain. Even though I go to university full time, I still manage to have a part time job in order to stay afloat. I'm lucky my parents cover my tuition, but my expenses, like my car payment, cell phone, food, are all on me. So I work part time on the weekends at a bar in downtown Gastown in Vancouver as a server. Now, if you know Gastown, you'll know that it's one of the oldest parts of Vancouver. Gastown was Vancouver's first downtown core and is named for Gassy Jack Dayton, a Yorkshire seaman, steamboat captain, and barkeep who arrived in 1867 to open up the area's first saloon. Go figure, right? Gastown is one of Vancouver's top tourist spots, where old meets new, and I felt very comfortable there, especially during tourist season. In a single day, I could chat with people from at least a dozen or so different countries. I loved it. Notice, I, I keep mentioning the bar in past terms. Here's the reason why. It was a night in June, and I was out of class for the summer, when I picked up a few extra shifts during the week. It was my first time closing that night, along with another server named Tori and Nigel, our bartender. Tori was wiping down and disinfecting tables, and Nigel was doing the same at the bar. During these COVID times, every night we had to make sure the entire place was disinfected before opening the next day. I had the pleasurable duty of having to wash down the bathrooms. Hey, I was the new girl, so I was quite okay with getting the dirty jobs. That's how the ball bounces sometimes. Our bathrooms were tiny by standards, as there was only one stall and a sink. I quickly finished the women's bathroom and made my way over to the men's across the hall. My hands were full of supplies. I pushed open the men's bathroom door, and as I started to go in, out of the corner of my eye, I see this thick, shadowy figure walking towards me fast. I don't recall anything else, but I must have screamed because when I came to my senses, I was on the ground with Tori and Nigel helping me back up. Nigel asked what happened. I said, there was a guy in there and I, I don't know. I guess he shoved me down. Did you hit your head? Nigel asked. I, I don't know. I, I don't think so. I started to cry because I didn't know what was going on and I was a little frightened. I don't know what happened, but all I really knew is that this shadow thing knocked me over. Tori, who was training to be a firefighter, slowly checked my neck and head for any bumps or cuts. She found neither, but what Tori did find was a chunk of my hair that had been ripped out of my head and lying on the floor. Who did this, Cassie? I, I, I don't know. Like I said, all I saw was this dark figure come at me from the men's bathroom. Nigel then ran back behind his bar and grabbed a baton that he had stashed back there for security. He came back to us, took a deep breath, and started to slowly open the men's bathroom door, just in case there was someone in there. Nigel was a pretty tough dude. His reputation as a black belt in jiu-jitsu made it comfortable for us ladies' safety at night. As he opened the door, he had his baton ready to swing at someone's head. When he got the door wide open, with us watching from the floor, there was no one there. What the hell? I said, as I swore there would be someone in there. Where'd he go? The only two exits to the bar would have seen the person have to go by both Tori and Nigel. They saw no one. Nigel then looked towards the women's bathroom and quickly opened the door. No one was in there either. All three of us were puzzled. 
As Tori helped me get up off the ground, we heard the sound of glass breaking from behind the bar. Nigel quickly ran the 30 feet to see what was up, and the entire mirror behind the bar had been shattered. It looked like someone had driven their fist right into the middle of the mirror, but once again, there was no one inside but us. We all looked at one another, both puzzled and scared. Screw this, Tori stated. We're out of here. Both Nigel and I agreed. We grabbed our belongings and ran out the door. Nigel locked up the building and then called the owner to tell him what happened. While Nigel was talking to the boss, I looked at Tori and I said to her, I'm never coming back here. I don't blame you, she stated. Neither am I.